Yes. Okay. I can hear you speaking now. Good. Good. So we are ready. So this is very auspicious because we have had all the problems at the beginning and everything else will be very easy. So we have some time today and tomorrow to look at the question of vulnerability in relation to Dharma. We can see with the spread of COVID just how vulnerable our human situation is. There are many people who have uh, no protection or defense uh, against the virus and have to work in ways that would daily expose them to infection. Or maybe if we begin just by sitting quietly for some minutes and uh, open our minds to all those who are in fear and danger and anxiety and send them our good wishes. So it's our practice always to keep a, an inclusive attitude towards all beings, whether they are human beings or animals or inhabiting any of the other realms of samsara. Now we know with the virus, the, what's recommended is to wear masks, to uh, maintain social distancing and to wash your hands frequently. This is uh, in Dharma terms, like a path of renunciation. One sees the uh, provocations that are around in the environment and tries to keep a distance away from them in order to have protection. So <clears throat> there are many uh, provocations in the world, not just the COVID virus. There are all kinds of scams uh, through the internet and mobile phone, people trying to get your bank details and so on so that our safety and security depends on uh, a vigilance and even a suspicious attitude. This uh, brings to, to, this highlights the fact that to be relaxed, spontaneous uh, and warmly connective is in fact an invitation to, to difficulty. So, cultures can easily take on an idea that it is um, unwise to be relaxed and at ease, and it's uh, much better to be very careful in everything you do. However, that makes uh, a, a deep sense of connectivity with whatever is occurring very difficult. And we find ourselves trapped in uh, valuing certain aspects of the world which seem safe and trying to keep a distance from the things which seem unsafe. It's very easy then to imagine an intentionality in the things which uh, make us feel scared. People start to think, oh, the virus is, is going to attack me. But as far as we know, the virus has no capacity for for volitional intention, and especially not for directing it at specific people. The other day, the president of Hungary was announcing that uh, Hungary is uh, under attack from Muslims who want to come in and destroy their good culture. So we see this all over the world. <clears throat> Certain groups are identified as the enemy and as people who are going to steal our way of life or destroy it. So as long as we have a, a strong duality between self and other, the other can uh, easily be identified as the enemy of itself. So when we come into a, a Mahayana orientation in Dharma, which is a broad and inclusive view, then we have to see that we are already infected with the virus of egotism. This is not something which is coming from outside and attacking us. This virus has already taken us over in the sense that through our thoughts, feelings, sensations, and memories, we maintain the sense that I exist as a separate entity. 
and with this we we uh, occupy uh, space in the in the binary opposition between existence and non-existence so it's normal for many people now to believe that when they die there is just nothing at all complete non-existence but when we uh, enter into the practice and we start to understand the nature of wisdom and compassion, we see that there is a middle way between existence and non-existence. It's not that we exist as some fully defined, separate, uh, autonomous entity, because clearly what we call I, me, myself is part of an ongoing conversation with the environment the arising of events, whether they seem external or internal, alter the patterning of what we take to be ourself. The instability of our self-formation means that we are uh, easily impacted by wonderful events and horrible events. By We are easily impacted by Mm -hmm. and internally uh, a happy memory can arise and our body relaxes or a, a memory of an unhappy time in our life arises and our body slumps what we see when we look with the Mahayana view is that this very uh, vulnerability or uh, Openness to change in the self-complex is also the basis for compassion. I arise in relationship with the environment. So when we practice meditation, we become very attentive to the details of how this specific moment is emerging. When we organize our experience through reliance on interpretive concepts, our uh, interpretation follows the pattern of language. That is to say, it's linear. This happened to me, I did this. So this keeps us inside this uh, paradigm of duality where self and environment are separate, but in some kind of contact. And thus we, we live in what the, the text called the three times of past, the linked present and the future. But when we simply relax and we are present with the emergence of experience, we see, sorry, Anil, we see that subject and object arise together in the immediacy of the emergence of this moment. I am not here ahead of what is occurring nor is the world here ahead of my connection so for example if i need something and i decide to go to my local shops i know where they are which means i can pattern thoughts and memories and plans to have a, a sense of how much time i need to to get there i am here the shops are there and I need 10 minutes to walk to get there. So when I'm living my conceptual life, my life mediated through reliance on interpretive concepts, this is how it seems. But as I walk to the shops, as my body is moving along the pavement, reacting to the unstable um, stones on the pavement, my posture and my visual perception of what is occurring and my hearing of the cars going by are all unique and specific and unrepeatable in this fresh immediacy of their presentation. When I talk or think about what is occurring, I'm thinking about a what is occurring. That is to say, the what is already a reified or substantiating mode of interpretation. But in the immediacy of moving, there is no what. 
there is the unrepeatable how of this specific patterning. So, in some daily event as simple as this, we can see how the, the virus or the infection of the notion of an enduring stable self creates a blindness to the freshness of the moment. The stability of the world and the stability of the self exists in the domain of concepts, but not in the domain of phenomena. Okay, they, they exist in the realm of concepts. And it is through our addiction to concepts that we maintain this infection as if it was a blessing. So in the Mahayana tradition, we are concerned to see the emptiness of all phenomena. Emptiness in Buddhism specifically means that there is no defining, enduring essence to anything. Or to put it in another language, the essence of everything is emptiness. No, the essence of everything is <laughs> That is to say that all the phenomena that we see arise in relation to other phenomena. And for most of us, we have to look at this again and again, because it contradicts our ordinary sense of functioning. So to use an example, some of us have uh, looked at many times, have used this example. Some of the people watching have, are familiar with this example. So I have a cup of tea in my hand. There is a cup. There is a hand. The hand is not the cup. The cup is not the hand. The cup is other than the hand. The cup exists inside the cupness of the cup. It is what it is, and what it is, is the cup. This seems obvious, but it is a lie, because the cup has to be somewhere cup in hand, cup on the table. Then the cup is in the kitchen, cup is being washed, cup is drying. The cup is always somewhere. Although the somewheres of the cup are not precisely determined, so I can't say where this cup will be in the afternoon. Its location will arise from interactive circumstances. However, the cup will always be somewhere. So again, this is the middle way. The cup doesn't exist just by itself. It exists in relation, but the relations are not over-determining or predetermining the exact location of the cup. And the value of the cup for me also changes with circumstances. I like to drink hot tea, but now the tea is cold, but I want some tea. So I have to have cold tea. So it's not so interesting. So the temperature of the tea is affecting my mood. So when we observe ourselves, we see this pulsation and fluctuation of uh, expansion and contraction moving all the time it, and so the the tea as the, the cup as a site of value is not fixed from this point of view the cup is not an entity but it is a potential of participation and this is very important because inanimate objects what we might call dead objects are also participants the object impacts the subject, the subject impacts the object. This is a dialogic flow, a conversation. In the more we are able to observe and hear the quality of this conversation, we see that it is the details of this moment which are so precious. The conclusion that I can draw about the cup takes the life out of the cup. The potential, the potential of the cup is revealed as it moves in the world with different circumstances. 
this is the ungraspability of the cup. The concept of the cup is quite graspable, but the immediate actuality of the cup as a re phenomena revealed in the moment is not graspable. So the more I see that I am undefinable because I am a co-emergent revelation, then I can start to see, oh, this is the situation for all living creatures, birds, fish, wa wasps, all are in conversation with the environment. About 50 years ago in Britain, they started to see how polluted the rivers were that level of pollution had become normal with all the factories pumping their waste into the river. And so the memory that there were once uh, fish like trout and salmon in the river had vanished. But as there has been more control on the pollution, more fish are coming back into the rivers. So this is what we see everywhere with the uh, ecological crisis the over-determining monologue of power defines nature as something for us, but of, of, of a monologue, of, of a one unidirection. You know, I mean, I can determine what nature is for. And, and now with the disasters that we can see everywhere, we are reminded that we need to have dialogue with nature because it is an interconnected system. And if we act onto nature, then nature will return the favor and act on us. And so we have to listen and not just speak. So this is the basis for the Mahayana view of compassion, that we are always already connected with all uh, sentient beings. And if we feel this connectivity, how they are for us will be revealed within uh, a mood of kindness. But if we don't feel this interconnectivity, our relation with others can be based on, simply on the manifestation of our wishes, only on the basis of uh, what of the uh, manifestation of my what I want to happen. And we see this in the history of colonialism, of racism, of slavery, of the exploitation of uh, poor people, for example, in the Congo, who are forced to, out of poverty, to work in terrible open mines where there are many injuries arise. And the uh, the amount of money that they're paid bears no relation to the amount of profit that the company makes by running the mine. And when the shareholders of the company open their uh, letter with their annual dividend, their focus of attention is on how much money they are getting and the suffering of the people who are exploited in order to produce this money is of no interest our tendency to say me first, and I'm not very interested in you, is pervasive. So in the Mahayana tradition, the more we see the interdependence of all phenomena and the actual uh, non-existence of true entities, then it's uh, very difficult to separate self and other. And then kindness and consideration arises automatically. We are not kind because we are somehow good people, but kindness flows from interdependence. And we see that the separation of self and other is simply like a conceptual mist obscuring the actual integrity of the entire field. Moreover, we have a, uh, a, a more inner or secret virus. This is the virus of ignorance and duality. 
ignorance is not attending to what is here, how it is. When we don't, uh, when we're not directly present in the emergence of this, there arises uh, interpretation, imagination, conclusions, narrative, and staying in this web of signifiers, we enter a profound dream time. So in the Buddhist tradition, uh, we, we have the tantric approach, which is part of Mahayana Buddhism. This is an antidote to ignorance and duality through uh, the practice of uh, devotion to the unborn radiance of the deity, we see the intrinsic unity of how we are and how the deity is. The divinity is like our true mother who has come to rescue us from this orphanage in which we live. In order to survive in the orphanage, we have adapted to the culture and learned uh, particular ways of survival. We've got used to our daily life, but sometimes we become more sensitive to the strangeness of our existence. <clears throat> we have a sense, is, is this really my life? Is this all there is? As we get older, we look back on the previous years and see how our enthusiasm just dissolved away. What seemed so important, what was going to be the profound meaning of our life, now becomes something that we used to do or used to believe in. From the Buddhist point of view, this kind of experience arises because actually what we take to be I, me, myself is a construct. It has no inherent truth or validity. Times changed and what was so normal is now abnormal. I read that in the mountain villages in Italy, there are fewer and fewer people. Life is hard. People move down into the plains, into the city to get an easier life. The young people leave, so there are no children for the school. Just a few old people meeting in the village square to create the museum of memories. But you can't have a full life in memory. Sometimes we change, sometimes the environment changes. So the practice of Tantra is intentional change in order to use our mutability as a door to liberation. If you are a woman, you can visualize yourself as a male deity. If you're a man, you can visualize yourself as a female deity. You imagine yourself to be this deity, just as you imagine yourself to be how you are. So very often when people go for therapy, they tell the therapist about how they are. That is to say, they talk about how they imagine their life is. But maybe the therapist can see and hear that there's a, a little disjunction, uh, a lack of harmony between the storyline and how the person is in their embodiment. So someone might say, oh, well, I've always been anxious. I was an anxious child. So this is quite an achievement to be anxious 24 hours a day, every day, every year. Through the reliance on the belief that I am an anxious person, it becomes a strange kind of comfort to know that this is how I am. And then wrapped within that belief, I don't actually see the fluctuations in my mood which occur due to circumstances. So again, we start to see, oh, the continuity or the permanence of who or what I take myself to be lies in the patterning of concepts, not in the actuality. So 
when we enter into a practice of visualization supported by mantra recitation, we are dissolving the rigidity of the fixed sense of who we are. And we start to see that this pattern, which is so familiar and feels, oh, this is me, is actually a dynamic expression the expression of my potential. So the ignorance of imagining that I have a true enduring individual essence starts to soften as I see that actually, even in my daily life, I show many different forms. And the functioning of these patterns has to do with their rhythm and not on the basis of some fixed determining uh, essence. I am evoked by the world. And the more I loosen up and dissolve my fixation, the more, on you go, the more there is uh, an accessing of the wider potential of my possibilities. And this is important in terms of compassion. Because if we are going to relate to other people, we have to relate to them as they are. And therefore, our plasticity, our pliability, our capacity to take on different forms is how we make connection with diverse people. So in this way, by applying the antidote of the meditation practice, Gradually, we soften the fixity of ego identity. And through this, our potential is free to manifest. We also have the approach of Dzogchen, which is simply to awaken to the intrinsic health, which is always there. We see that whatever arises, arises just as it is, and then dissolves just as it is that every experience is a momentary patterning of the potential. This potential is not my potential as if it was a personal property. Rather, this felt sense of the individuality of I, me, myself is one mode of expression of potential. The primordial ground or source has the potential to display everything limited, which is what we call samsara, and everything liberated, what is called nirvana. None of these patterns has any inherent existence. Inherent, inherent existence. That is to say, they are like uh, images in a dream, or a rainbow in the sky, or a mirage. They appear, but they don't, they are not the appearance of something. They are pure appearance. And in this, they are, everything is light. Light in weight and light as bright. So this is, this is how it is from the very beginning. Everything is included in this. And because of this, the duality of health and sickness, virus and uh, medication has no, it has a manifestation, but no essence. Feeling sad because of certain events and feeling very, very happy because of other events has us moving up and down like a cork on the waves. When we experience this, then we can know, oh, I am trapped in this uh, ego matrix. Because uh, as we will look in more detail, our mind itself is not a thing. In the mind itself, as it is, it's not a thing. And it is the belief, the idea, the imagining of thingness which is our blindness. So we'll take a break now. And if you're interested, as you uh, get up and move around, you can observe how you conceptualize your experience. 
when you see something that uh, you really like and you believe is good. Maybe you have a painting that uh, touches you. Don't stay with the conclusion that it's gorgeous, but rather stay present with the aesthetic experience of how this uh, pattern of colors and shapes touches you. And later you can look again at the painting, tuning in to again to this uh, subtle patterning of uh, impact or conversation and see if this has changed from how it appeared before. The, the painting is a potential speaking to your potential. And if you are present, this potential emergence or the co-emergence of these potentials is always fresh. Okay, so if we take a break for uh, say 25 minutes and be back at quarter past. Okay, good. Okay. So we can look a little bit more at uh, vulnerability and what it means. It, it comes from the Latin word uh, fullness for a, a wound. It's very similar to the word trauma. Oh, a wound occurs in our body when we come in contact with the environment. We get a cut or a bone breaks and comes through the skin and so on. Vulnerability indicates that we can always be wounded, that there is no time when wounding can't occur. We manifest with our body, our voice and our mind. And uh, clearly uh, we can be wounded through the body. And we can also be wounded through speech, through being insulted or uh, not rewarded for all the things that we do. And these woundings arriving through the body and the voice uh, impact uh, the wounding of our mind. We can be, uh, we are vulnerable at each and every stage of our life. Some babies die in the womb. Some babies die in the womb because the belly of the pregnant woman was kicked by their drunken partner. So, at any stage, difficulties can occur. To be wounded is to have the shape of your existence altered. The way in which it occurs is primarily twofold. We have invasion and abandonment. Invasion is when uh, the, the space that we need for the um, security of our existence uh, is impinged on, is, in, is penetrated into by factors we don't like. This can happen from an intention, somebody might want to harm us. It can happen as an accident, for example, being hit by lightning in the storm. It can occur due to viruses, sicknesses which are just uh, or potentials for sickness moving in the atmosphere but we're also vulnerable to abandonment when we're born uh, we have many many years in which we are dependent on the good activity of other people it's very easy to abandon small babies the the baby might not actually be being abandoned but they get lonely and they start crying and if you didn't get much sleep, you don't want to hear them crying anymore. So in that way, uh, to get the right uh, interface, the harmonious co-emergence of self and environment is quite difficult. As we grow up and develop, we um, have develop a more and more defined sense of who we are, what we like and what we don't like which is confirming of our sense of self. But that's also the basis for quarrels and conflicts in relationships. If only you were more like me, we wouldn't have our difficulties. And of course, this happens in work situations as well. 
you might be manifesting your good qualities and helping the, the, the success of the, the team you belong to. But this can evoke envy in other people in the team. So it, it can seem that although you try to do good, the result you get is not good. Having to manage other people's emotions as well as our own can be very tiring. Because as we started to look before, we, we live in a world of interpretation. And we interpret according to our assumptions and the particular schemas we believe in. For example, in America, the Democrats were wanting to have a proper investigation of the attack that was made uh, in the final days of uh, Trump's uh, presidency on Washington. But the uh, other party has refused to do this. The Republicans say, no, we don't need to do this. Now, when these politicians are elected, they all swear to do their best for the country and for the people who they represent. But Inside each of them, there is a big dark planet, very dense. And the gravitational pull of what about me bends their pure intention to benefit others. And of course, it's easy to imagine that what benefits me benefits the country. Because who wants to live with inner tension and self-doubt? So if I don't need this unnecessary stress, I can simply assert I am right and you are wrong. So in this way, we see that how we manifest into the world is, is very rarely clean and uh, simple. So few people agree with us. And yet we feel that we see things properly. And of course, if you become interested in Buddhism, this is not exactly the most popular tune in town. No, now you, you go into this very small minority interest. Why are you looking into all these difficult questions when you could just enjoy yourself? It used to be fun being with you. You were so always laughing. And now you're thinking about future lives and, oh, it's really boring. So somehow, just even by pursuing some deeper concerns, you end up impacting the people around you in ways that they're not so happy with. Your poor parents are thinking, oh, did we not bring you up pro properly? You become Buddhist. What's wrong with the way we are? So there we, we can see that the, the house of the ego, the particular construction of our ego identity has a shape which is not easily compatible with other people's ego shapes. We don't want to hurt other people or upset them, yet just by being ourselves we seem to cause trouble. This is how I am. How else could I be? This is the difficulty of the ego self because it believes it is a fixed entity. Or rather, it doesn't believe this, but it is the manifesting of that belief. Who believes this? Who is the actual believer? This is what we can examine when we, when we do the meditation a bit later. But, you know, in gro growing up is quite difficult. There are so many options, so many pathways your life could take. Some things you consciously decide on, but for many aspects of life, just somehow we find ourselves being drawn towards this or that. This can cause us to feel out of control. I don't know why I do what I do. I decide to stop smoking and then I find myself buying new cigarettes. I decide that we've, I've come to the end of a relationship and I feel happy, but then I feel lonely. And then I go back into the relationship, although I know it's not going to work. So in that moment, I am governed by the, my, the fusion of my potential into the mood of loneliness. Now, 
if we believe that we are a conscious ego, and this is the truth of my existence, then I can feel completely stupid and pathetic that my loneliness just takes me into more trouble. Why do I do it? I've got to sort myself out. But what we were looking at earlier is because phenomena arise independent origination, I'm not uh, an autonomous uh, agent, a manager in charge of my life. But if I'm not in control of my life, then you're in control of my life, and I don't want that. And again, we're back with a either or. Either it's me in charge or you in charge. So from the general Dharma position, this is where we would start to look at karma. The karma is a word which simply means activity. When we act, we make a some shape or pattern in the immediate environment, I act on this situation. I am changing the pattern around me in order to fulfill my wishes. I am imposing my will and I feel entitled to do it. If I decide to fry some tomatoes, I don't apologize to the tomato first. I pull them off their stalk. I'm separating you from the plant which has fed you and given you life. And I take my knife and I cut you in half and into the hot oil for me. Generally, we wouldn't see this as a, an act of violence. We don't speak tomato language, so it doesn't bother us too much. Oh, we can see as we move through the world, we are used to this uh, imposition of our desire as a valid shaper of circumstances. And the farmers do this, take this further in terms of how they control the animals, separating the young calves from the cow, castrating the young bullocks. The, the farmer has a sense of the market price for the different animals. And they have to formulate uh, a way of taking care of the animals in order to have them good, in good quality for the market. They benefit the animals in order to benefit themselves. And of course, human beings have been very exploitative to many other human beings. And this occurs still in almost every continent in the world. So the, the Buddhist notion of karma is to have a sensitivity to the directional force of my intention in this moment. If I act on animals or aspects of the world or people, where the focus of my concern is my own benefit, there is a lack of um, evenness in, in our attitude. We have a bias. The things that benefit me are important. The things that benefit you are not so important. And this is what gives rise to the narrow tendencies and the particular self-referential vibration which generates difficult situations in future because if there is a tilt in one direction in the causal situation then you get a corresponding tilt in a future situation so if you're in connected with someone and you often don't see them as a subject, but rather as an object to act for you to act on, then <clears throat> you, increase, <clears throat> you increase the possibility of an unimpeded unidirectional movement. That is to say, I don't attend to the feedback that you seem to be unhappy with what I am doing. Because if I was to see you as a subject, 
and attend to how you show your feelings, I wouldn't be able to act freely. So to see you in your fullness, I will be interrupted, but I don't want to be interrupted. So it's easier not to pay attention to you. So when you read texts concerned with karma, this is the, this is the main point. When you have, sorry, on you go. Privileging subjectivity on one side and condemning the other to be an acted on object brings a, a later compensatory rebalancing, which you become the object that is acted on. Now, this in, in terms of vulnerability, this is very interesting. In order to protect my interests, I need to put me first. So I put barbed wire around my country and I forcibly push out any immigrants. If immigrants come across the sea on a boat, I don't want them to land in my country. Why are they coming here? It's my country. They should stay in their country, in their hot and unpleasant country because they want to come here and have the good things that I have. So they want to take these things from me. So they are thieves. So I'm not going to let them in. So clearly we can see that mental construction. Now, if I say, well, I like to have a nice place to see. I like to feel safe. I like to have enough food to eat. And they also would like that. That's why they want to come here. But if they all came here, what would happen? I don't want to share. They would get more and I would get less. They would win and I would lose. So we see that this kind of interpretation raises very strong emotions all across the world. If I took your suffering seriously, I would suffer. Why would I do that? So the, this is <clears throat> the self-serving uh, intention to organize the world for my own benefit or the benefit of those people I like creates this uh, strongly biased movement in the mind. That is to say that not only in my flesh and blood body am I vulnerable, but the, in my economic body, I am also vulnerable. The economic structure of my culture, where I can have an easy, good life, will be damaged by these other people. And I am like this, and they are like that. I don't, why would they come here? They are not like me. And unfortunately, as climate change increases its impact on environments, we are likely to see these conflicts becoming hotter and hotter. And for Buddhists, uh, this is very challenging. It's a very nice idea to take the Bodhisattva vow and say in this and all my future lives, I will work for the benefit of others. In theory, it's wonderful. But in practice, it becomes more difficult. Because one of the reflections we have is that because we have been born many, many times, in each of these lives, we have had a mother and the mother has taken care of us. And this has occurred so many times that each sentient being in samsara has at one time been our own mother. And so we have a debt of gratitude towards them. This also is a very beautiful idea. But when the immigrant arrives and they don't look like me. Really? You've been my mother? You took care of me? And now I should take care of you? And there's a lot of you? I'll give you a Buddhist book. That's enough. Because once you get entangled, it's very difficult. How much should I give? For meditators, the, the issue is not to... to engage in total sacrifice so that you end up with nothing. Clearly, we can help as much as is possible. 
But what we want to do is to look for the vibration which is set up in us when we feel we are being exploited or taken advantage of. Because the ego is vulnerable. The idea is uh, not the same as the lived moment. In the Bible, the, at Easter, we can read the story of how uh, Jesus is there with his close disciples. They're saying to him, hey, we're with you all the way. But gradually, as the more difficult events occur, they fade away. I, I, I don't know this guy. Nothing to do with me. So this is, a, this is a sign that these people trying their best, doing their best, had not found a way to dissolve the ego nexus. This is why in Buddhism, there is a very strong uh, linking between wisdom and compassion. Wisdom is to uh, see directly the emptiness of all phenomena, including ourselves. That is to say, I am a ceaseless flow of energy forming in patterns with the emergence of the shapes of the environment, always changing. So what is, what is this thing that I'm trying to protect? Looking back on our lives, we've seen that we have had so many shapes, so times of expansion and times of retraction. How could we define ourselves since we are in fact co-emergent? And this is the same with all sentient beings. For example, in England, the, the month of May has been very cold and wet. And this affected many insects because this was a time when they should have been expanding more and they didn't. And many birds arrived flying north for the summer looking for insects and the insects weren't there. Whether we live or die, whether we thrive or we struggle, this depends on circumstances. So when we think of compassion, all the creatures that we encounter in all the six realms of samsara are also manifesting according to circumstances. Due to causes and conditions, this, this arises. Mm -hmm. So, due to the fact that somebody was born <clears throat> in a family with alcoholic parents who had a difficult childhood, that's not difficult to understand because we can compare and contrast uh, alcoholic parents or non-alcoholic parents. But Dharma is inviting us to go further and think, okay, the, the, the qualification of these people as alcoholic, there are people who can drink alcohol or not drink alcohol. In, on that level of discourse, we take it for granted that there are people and people exist. That's obvious. So the, we have the noun, the, the person, and then to that we can add different qualities, young, old, intelligent, poor, and so on. We can't say this, uh, this nothing is more beautiful than that nothing. That would sound crazy. But we have to remember that emptiness or nothingness doesn't mean nothing at all. It means no individual defining essence, but uh, not having any internal defining essence. If you have a potato, you can't turn it into a cauliflower. No, call it a cabbage, call it a cabbage, cabbage. I don't. <laughs> so if you are a person, how are you going to become a Buddha? People are people, Buddhas are Buddhas. If you're really a person, and that's what you are, then that is both the security of your identity and the functional limitation of your potential. So then the idea of being becoming enlightened is ridiculous. Children grow up and become adults, and then they become old and they die. 
if a human being becomes a Buddha, then maybe the Buddha can become a frog because the Buddha was a human being. Now it's a Buddha, maybe become a frog or a dog. So this is where we see the, the Mahayana teaching going deeper. Uh, the Buddha was never a human being and neither are you truly a human being. You are a flow of energy moving in a field of energy. To be a man or a woman is a conventional identification. There are some countries where we, women have a lot of freedom and there are some countries where women have very little freedom. So to say this is a woman doesn't necessarily have much definitional value. The female body is a potential which can manifest in different ways according to circumstances. And from the Buddhist point of view, when you are born, oh, sorry, when you are conceived, when you come into the beginning of life in your mother's body, the energetic uh, potential, which is the basic consciousness, comes into contact with the male and female uh, vital energies as they meet and through the relation between these three factors you have the development of the fetus which is influenced by what was evoked by the uh, mental energy if you like the consciousness as it came into the sexual situation and saw the sexual organs in union so according to the tradition, as the consciousness comes in, if it is particularly attracted to the vagina, it will, the fetus will develop with a male body. If it's particularly attracted to the penis, it will, the fetus will develop with a female body. So this is saying, this is men and women are not fixed entities. They are part of an ongoing interactive conversation between the energetic elements of the world, which then unfolds in the course of a life due to the emergence of the operation of certain hormones, the body changes at puberty. Then this changes, of course, later in life around the menopause and so on. People don't do this to themselves. This is how this karmic energy of being born with this kind of body or that kind of body manifests. So it's the logic of the karmic expression which generated this formation for a while. So you can see this by looking at your own life. As the years go by and your body changes, the factors of the biochemical movement of the contents of your body bring about doors opening and closing for how you participate in the world. The reason for reflecting in this way is to free yourself from the delusion that you are a fixed thing. I am an ever-changing stream of experience. When I say I, it represents the particular patterning of this potential of emergence in this moment. I refers to a, this particular moment of patterning of the field. Ignorance in Buddhism means not seeing this, but imagining that I refers to some overdetermined essence, personal essence inside me. So we say things like, well, it's my body as if we were somehow in charge of it. But we are not in charge of our heart beating, which is very good luck for us because we are so easily distracted, we would forget to keep pumping. So my body is not really mine. It's referring to a relationship, but not one of ownership or mastery. So the more we reflect in this way and soften our thick sense of I exist as myself, then we see, oh, whatever conclusions I come to about myself, whatever way I define myself is situational and not absolute. So when I encounter other people, 
what is the basis for my defining them? I seem to have strong opinions about different kinds of people. And uh, this uh, conclusion or definition is there on the basis of the concepts I use to describe them to me. So I, the movement of my mind, the movement of the contents of my mind, sensations, feelings, memories, and so on, generate the particular pattern I take to be I, me, myself. And a similar thing functions when I think this person is from Africa or from China. China and Africa are concepts. These are ideas. We study something about them at school. We say, oh, there are many people in Africa, but there are even more people in China. What people are, live in China? Oh, Chinese people live there. Now I know something. This tells us nothing about individual people there. Chinese is a conventional identification. But when you meet an individual, there are this emergent movement of the five elements through the five senses. If you have a real connection, then you are touched and moved by how they are. So in Dharma, we believe that the great bodhisattvas like Tara and Chenrezig are always touched and moved by the suffering of beings. They are not sealed off. They are not living inside a self-referential bubble. They don't defend themselves against pulsation of interaction. So maybe with this, we can see when I take myself to be a fixed thing, and I see other people as fixed things, this is the limit of compassion. Because if I open to the other person, I will be, I will be interrupted. And that will put the movement of my life in a new trajectory. So when we see the, the Buddhas in meditation, their legs are in this uh, lotus position, uh, the, what, <coughs> legs crossed over each other. This is a, a, a seat or asana which uh, keeps you stable but prevents you moving. But the great bodhisattvas, they, they are not locked in this way. They usually have one leg out or they are standing and they are ready to respond. Tara is often described as the quick one, like a flash of lightning she responds into situations. So, it's not that one of these is better than the other, because as we will see later, we both need to be in this stable, settled position, what is called the unchanging Dharmakaya, and also to be in the position of connectivity, which is the Sambhogakaya, which means an availability through the senses for enjoyment and uh, participation. And our practice is to bring these two together simultaneously so that being touched and moved is no longer a position of vulnerability of people are doing things to me. The defensiveness of the ego is dissolved to open up a space of availability because the great bodhisattvas are not starting from a place of isolation. I want to help you. You're starting from separation. But when we relax the ego fixation, we see that outside and inside arise together simultaneously. And therefore the responsiveness of compassion is automatic. And as we enter into the practice, uh, from time to time, we find ourselves retracting in an ego-defensive way. And then we come to this uh, existential crossroads. If I defend my ego, I abandon my open awareness. And if I rest in open awareness, I don't need to concern myself with the swirling limited patterns of ego possibility. Okay, so we have a, a break now.
for an hour and a quarter. We're back at 1.45 London time. Good. So, see you later. Bye for now. Bye. Okay. So, let's continue. Vulnerability indicates vulnerability to suffering. So, the teachings of the Buddha begin with the Four Noble Truths. In the first is the, the truth of suffering, that it's all-pervading. It's often uh, analyzed into three aspects. There's the suffering of suffering, which is when something is manifestly painful, like um, being in a car accident and being hurt. The second is the suffering of change, because as factors around us or in our body change, the stable sense of our identity is put into question. Sometimes there's an excitement that comes with change. Sometimes there is anxiety and dread. One of the factors, as we'll see with the ego, is its reliance on concepts to stabilize its sense of the situation. The ego likes to believe that how it thinks about the world gives it a very direct sense of how the world actually is. And therefore, if the patterns of phenomena shift in such a way that there is a a mismatch between my concept about a place or a person and how they are manifesting in the moment, then there is suffering. As the Buddha pointed out many times, all compounded phenomena or compounded things are impermanent. Compounded there means uh, brought together, made, fabricated. If you live in a city, it's fairly obvious that you're encountering compounded phenomena. But even if you're in the countryside, you experience not just the trees, but your idea of the trees. And when the idea and the actuality go apart, then you have this suffering of change. So in some of the hill places in Britain, you used to just walk up the grassy slope and then the stony slope to get to the top. But gradually, as more people go to the country to walk, especially with uh, being tired of this uh, viral lockdown, as they walk up the hill, they wear through the grass into the earth. And then the country guardian put in little wooden steps so that you're walking as if you were in a big building. So the enjoyment of the wilderness commodifies the wilderness. In the, the third kind of uh, suffering is the suffering of compoundedness. This is the suffering of the fundamental unreliability of our interpretation of experience. Born in this life with a human body, we have our school education and so on. So we relate to the world in terms of the concepts we've learned. It's said that generally the karmic cause of birth as a human being is a mixture of desire and pride. We have an inflated sense of ourself and uh, our desire gives us a selective attention where we privilege some things and not others. We find it difficult to imagine how a horse experiences the world or a fly, or a fish. But that doesn't matter because we are much more important than horses and flies and fish. So in that way, human beings protect themselves against the suffering of compoundedness. They do this by ignoring the information which could contradict the reason for So it says that this level of suffering is like um, 
for us, it's like having a speck of dust in our hand, but for the Buddha, it's like having a speck of dust in the eye. So they feel a, a, a real sensitivity to this self-deception, whereas we can find our um, merging into our own assumptions as the total truth we can find that reassuring. So the way to be free of the three levels of suffering is not to be present as an ego self. So in the Four Noble Truths, suffering is followed by uh, identifying the cause of suffering, which is ignorance and grasping. And the activity of grasping arises because the subject experiences items in the world it can take hold of. Then the third uh, truth is that suffering can come to an end. It can come to an end because it has no inherent validity. It is a construct, something arising due to causes. So when the causes stop, the results stop. The ego has a cause. When we are fully identified with our ego, this is a frightening idea. Generally speaking, we feel we are immortal. Even if you know you're going to die, it's a, it's a kind of abstract knowledge. As far as we can remember, we have always been here. And since I've always been me, it is as if the meanness of me is something continuous. And therefore, there is a resistance to seeing the sensation of the ego nexus. Uh, the ego nexus, the cessation of the ego nexus. If I am the ego and the ego dies, that's pretty bad luck for me. So if you are a modern materialist, you don't want to waste your life meditating because you're going to die and the ego will vanish anyway. But from the Buddhist point of view, the ego arises due to certain causes. And now we can look at this in more detail. We are used to the idea of a creator God, some eternal force which creates the basis for the limited lifespans of uh, creatures. From the Buddhist point of view, there is no God at all, not in the, certainly not in the uh, Semitic uh, notion. Everything of samsara and nirvana, of limitation and liberation arises like a dream, here and then gone, here and then gone. When the, the ground of this uh, display of the transient moment of presence is something we open to, then we can recognize that the, my mind is indeed this empty source of experience. Arising like a dream, the images of self and other are revealed and disappear in the space of awareness. This becomes obvious if you look and see that your mind has no substantial basis. But although all the forms of limited experience, all the forms of samsara are themselves like an illusion or a dream and have never actually been born, the illusion of samsara is the illusion of real existence. It is a belief. Something occurs. It's just an idea, but it stands in the place of something real. So we all know that we have this capacity. If when you were a child and you looked at cartoons, you see creatures who don't exist but you believe they exist. Some people spend a lot of uh, money to go to Disneyland. They see people walking around with big plastic heads being Donald Duck. This is clearly not 
Donald Duck. This is some poor person on minimum wage, but people believe. And when the man with his Donald Duck hat or head on waves, the children all wave back very excited. So in that way, belief can make an illusion seem more real than ordinary life. This is not just the marketing skill of this Walt Disney Corporation. It is the capacity of our own mind to believe in this way. So according to the teachings of the primordial Buddha Samantabhadra, appearances are arising and dissolving, arising and dissolving arising out of nothing, showing and dissolving into nothing, like the waves in the sea. But for no particular reason, just as a magical possibility, one aspect of the potential of the ground, the, there is something. This something is a, an instant densification, thickening of, of the appearance. So when we see something, there's this, the shape and color. And as you move, this is shifting, dissolving. Something else is occurring. You cannot actually grasp the appearance because it's not the appearance of something. It's the appearance of nothing. This nothing is not a dead nothing, but a, a full, rich nothing. As with our familiar example, it's like the mirror. A mirror is nothing. You can't find anything in it as the mirror. Yet it shows many, many reflections. You can see the reflection, but you can't actually catch a reflection and take it out of the mirror. However, it is as if you can catch the reflection. In, and we do this by merging our concept of what we see with the appearance that we see. And this merging makes the ungraspable graspable. You don't actually grasp the reflection. You grasp your idea about the reflection, but the delusion or the mental obscuration is the way in which it is as if you have actually grasped the, the truth of the reflection. It's the same with people. You have the concept of the person and the name of the person, and that permits you to imagine you've met this person before because they exist as someone. You have not met me before. This is just it. When you think you know James Lowe, you know the idea of James Lowe. More specifically, you think you know your James Lowe, which is your idea of James Lowe. And for sure, your idea of James Lowe is much more reliable than the actual James Lowe. Because as we looked before, our manifesting in the world is co-emergent with circumstances. And so the how of this being here, the this, is determined by many factors. And that how is showing with many, many, many details. So for some reason, I'm leaning forward on my table and my hands are pushing on the edge of the table. I don't know why, but this is the precise patterning of my body at the moment. But James, come on, if you move your body, you're still James. So, is this true? The idea of James, the name of James can be applied to these many different patterns. In this uh, grasping or appropriation of the image is in fact the mad mother of identity, because it is this belief in the truth. Oh, this is James. This gives birth to James. 
James is then born as something knowable. But as I am moving and changing moment by moment, <clears throat> this is the energy of potential moving in the womb of the great mother. And then the midwife of ignorance takes the, the tweezers, the, the, uh, the forceps of duality and pulls the baby out. The baby dies in being born. When you know people, you know corpses because life is always changing. Your idea of the person is a dead shadow, a dead echo of what once was vibrant. So this one who would seem to take hold of, whether it's about ourselves or someone else, this ghost is what we consider the ego self. It is reliable because it has been pulled out of the river of life <clears throat> and is preserved in the formaldehyde of abstraction. And this is how we go around in the world. The gain is that we seem to have a world of predictable objects. So I can take my idea of Giovanna as I see the image on my screen. And in my mind, I can compare that with my image of Giovanna when I met her in Italy before and think maybe, oh, maybe if the virus clears in some future time, we can again do some live meeting in Italy. So, so like a carved piece on a chessboard, I can move Giovanna around from the past to the future, to here to there. Oh yes, I know Giovanna. In, in fact, not at all. What I know is some memories, that's all. But the ego lives on memory and thought. In the, from India, the, the Tibetans took the, the idea of the, the Gandharvas, the Driza, a, a class of spirit. Yeah, in Tibetan, in, in India, it's called, they're called Gandharva. No, no, it, in Tibet, in Tibet, language is called Driza. Mm -mm. Okay, so Driza means smell eater. Mm -hmm. So this is like an image of the ego. This is a very extreme form of anorexia. You don't need any substantial food at all. The basic food of the ego is the concept of things which exist. So this is strange. The, 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 the kind of guarantor or the validator of my existence is a ghost. And because I believe in the ghost, I operate as if it's real, just as the children in Disneyland wave to Donald Duck. The belief makes the unreal seem real. The belief makes the unborn seem to be born as a separate entity. So again, this is even more strange. The belief in existence is existence. There are no self-existing phenomena. All phenomena manifest in interdependence. But I believe I'm looking on my screen at Giovanna. She exists. The reason I know she exists is because I believe she exists. I trust my belief. Now, I am looking at a picture on a computer screen. There is nobody there. But for me, Giovanna, I am willing to believe that this image is the truth of Giovanna. I don't even think that the image on the screen is some representation of Giovanna. Because when we believe in it, when we open ourselves to the image, it seems to be a living presence. So in the Dzogchen tradition, 
this, what we've just been looking at is the first level of ignorance. This is how ignorance first manifests. Sometimes first it means in time before time, it has always, it's always been like this for samsara. Sometimes we can see it also as the first veil in this moment. So there is this light, sound, shapes, and then just tilting this very slightly, this is Giovanna. This, this is, this is Giovanna. And once we establish an identification onto this is, there is more solidity. Simply this is fresh. It's always this, 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 this. Move your head around. In order to make use of this, you have to transform it into this is. That is to say, this is present or showing, but it doesn't exist. If you go out on a full moon night and you see a reflection of the moon in a still pond, in the pond you see this shimmering white circle. This, it's just this. What is it? Already the question is implying it is a something. This is not enough for the ego. The ego can't do anything with this. But if you add is, exists onto this, now the ego can start to build. This is the moon. We believe, oh, this is the moon. It's a reflection, but look, wow, it's the moon. Oh, look at the rainbow. There is nothing to catch in a rainbow. Nothing to catch in an echo. And yet we can talk about it and think about it as if it was apprehendable. So the, the strength of the ego is its vulnerability. The strength of the ego is to believe that what is not true is true. So it's the power of delusion, deluded about itself and deluded about whatever else it sees. And in this uh, assertion, there is a force. If we look around where, whatever we can see from where we are now, this, 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 there's nothing to do. But as soon as we have this is, there is something to do because the, the reified appearance becomes a thing on which I, as the agent, can act. So you, hopefully you can see that the solidification of the object empowers the subject. There is something to be done to something. Mm, that makes sense. But there is something to be done to nothing. Maybe that doesn't make sense. So the sub once the subject is forming, once I exist, even in a very fine form, I assert myself by doing. Now we see this with small children. From nine months on, that doing and doing and doing and grasping and banging. Banging is very popular. What I see from my window is the, the parents walking along regularly and the children of five and six are hopping and swirling and doing many different things because just walking is too boring. And uh, boredom thins the self. So if I can just hop on one leg, oh, it's now it's very exciting. So we can see all the things that human beings do to generate a sense of their agency. I can do this and the importance of what they do. Now, when this uh, ego first occurs, it's like a, a water bubble. There is air in the bubble and air outside the bubble. And the water containing the air is transparent. 
so you have a fine level or a thin level of separation of inside and outside, although this boundary is transparent. But as the ego has more interactions in the environment, there is an accumulation of a patterning. This is uh, the fourth of the five heaps or skandhas. These are samskaras, these are mm, compositional movements. So you can see, it's not exactly the same, but you, similar you can see in child development that as the, the child becomes around one and they're able to start to stand a bit more and then by the time they're 18 months and they're moving more quickly, they have an embodied confidence and as the child is relating to the world, it's engaged with many feedback loops. So the self-reflexivity of acting on the world has a corresponding validation of the self as the actor. And in this way, the child goes from being a water bubble to a balloon. When you blow up a balloon, the air in the balloon and the air around it is the same but the skin is no longer transparent. Its opacity, it's a, the, the fact that we cannot penetrate it directly, allows us to have more fantasies about what is inside. When a baby is very small, the mother often has a very connective intuition. So it's as if they can read what is happening for the baby. But by the time the child is four, there is an opacity. The child is learning that they can hide things. And if the mother said, did you take that chocolate? No. No, no mama. So in that way, the, the child is becoming impenetrable. They're having a private internal life. And this leads to more pressure on speech as the way of revealing what is inside. But language is a system of representation. It's never the thing itself. It's a version, a, 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 a cooked presentation. And therefore, experience shared through language is always cooked. Now, in the Dzogchen teachings, it describe how the mind is naked, raw, fresh. This is direct. It cannot be said. And this is the same issue we have with the Dharma teaching. I can talk about it. I can give many examples to make it feel a bit more here. But it is actually only in our own meditation practice, sitting with the mind, that you relax into this unborn openness. So this uh, opacity, which is the protective skin of the ego, is simultaneously the obscuration to enlightenment. The obscure and the illuminated are opposites. This view or this fact is uh, the basis for a lot of the purification practices we have in Dharma. If we remove the obscurations, then all will be clear. The view in Dzogchen is different because where do the obscurations come from? They come from emptiness. They are empty. There is no separate factory making real things. There is only illusion seemingly th becoming thicker by being layered illusion upon illusion upon illusion. And so in the practice, we simply sit with whatever is occurring. Sometimes the mind seems clear and bright. Sometimes it seems dull. Both are patternings moving in the space of the mind. So if we go back to what we looked at a little before, this, this is, this is 
something. The, when you're sitting in the meditation practice and different kinds of experience are arising, our habitual tendency is to interpret it in terms of this is something. My mind is dull today. I can't meditate like this. So now you've arrived at this is something and it's not good. But when you become aware of this tendency, it's important to relax in the out breath. And there's this. As long as it is this, it will be self-arising and self-dissolving. But, but even just a little bit of this is, is already bringing a density. And this will easily pull us into uh, an internal dialogue, a, a dualization. Because this is something, something is happening. And when you have something is happening to me, this quickly hooks our tendency to judge and I like it or I don't like it. And then we have the attribution of value, which we experience as being intrinsic in the appearance. So just as being very balanced in our posture is good, so that the weight of the head is going down the spine and to be rested on the pelvis, and then the muscles don't have to be working hard to maintain your posture. So just as if, you, if, if your uh, posture is good, all your weight is going down through your spine, to your pelvis, to your feet, and your muscles aren't having to work to keep you vertical. So similarly, if your mind is settled, in its own ground, in, in its own place, then whatever comes can come and go. But when the mind is disturbed and off balance, then the impulse to go into desire, attachment, involvement, or aversion, anger, anxiety arises strongly. It is the energy of the mind that thickens the content of the mind and hides the truth of the mind. It, it um, thickens the content of the mind and obscures or hides the, the truth of the mind or the nature of the mind. Okay, let's take a break here for half an hour back at half past. Good, thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe we be maybe good to do some practice now. We've looked at the way that identification as the ego self is inseparable from vulnerability. So that points to the, the central focus in the meditation, which is to release ourselves from the fixity of the ego positioning. As long as we locate it in our uh, familiar embodied sense of self, we have a fixed point of reference. And this functions as the point at which subject and object seem to be two separate things. In some forms of meditation, like uh, general vipassana, we are concerned to be an observer, a neutral observer without bias, but maintaining the clarity of uninvolvement. And this is arising on a relative level because one is holding oneself apart. I am mindful of what is occurring. I can see what is occurring. So you can see with that kind of formulation the I or the sense of self is apart from what is occurring. As if you are sitting on the banks of a river watching the water flowing. But in uh, Dzogchen, we want to relax out of this positioning so that we are without limitation, like the sky, allowing whatever arises to come and move in the sky. Sometimes what is arising seems to be subject, sometimes it seems to be object. 
don't get involved in this. Relax and open. And whatever comes, however it comes, allow it to be there and trust that it will go by itself. So <clears throat> we will do several sessions of meditation just now. We'll do it quite short sittings because our goal is not to struggle, but to, to simply relax and open. So at first we can just relax by breathing out and being present. It, if possible, it's preferable to do this with your eyes open. Rest your gaze about uh, one and a half meter in front of you in the space with your weight properly held by your skeleton, breathing in a relaxed, easy way. Okay. Okay, so the more you sit in this simple way with no specific practice to do, you're not trying to do anything or make anything happen. You're simply being present as you are. The obstacles and habit formations will show themselves. For example, it's very common to have a internal commentary running you might find yourself evaluating how you're doing <clears throat> if this happens don't try to change it or stop it but if you keep the image of having a, a, a vertical axis you don't want to rock forward and fuse with whatever is occurring nor to lean back away from what is occurring what is occurring is the energy or brightness of your own mind. If you interpret it as something that is happening to you, it, you will be in endless activity. We relax and open. The mind is like the sky. There is no fixed ego reference point. On the other hand, of course, the, the felt sense of um, subjective agency arises, this is energy, not substance. It is movement. I am movement. I am movement in the stillness that I am. There is no contradiction between the openness of the sky and the wind blowing in the sky. The sky is not attacked by the wind. When the wind blows, it moves the air. So if you keep the sense of this image, when you find yourself going this way and that way, it's because there is an identification with the subtle traces of the ego matrix. We can use the traditional notion of the five elements to, to see the patternings of the ego. So sometimes we are like earth, solid, stuck, decisive, a strong sense of I am here-ness. At other times we have a sense more like we are a flow. The flow of experience is how I am. Sometimes we're more with the fire element and we find strong, impetuous arousal occurring of desire or aversion. As we sit and relax, these three aspects become thinner and less um, seemingly internally definitive. But their subtle traces can be like the wind moving. And so movement within the air brings turbulence in the air. When this occurs, open more. It's very difficult to um, describe this in language. If I say open more, it sounds like an instruction. You have to make yourself more open, but that, that's impossible because the one who is you is inside this uh, bubble of self. 
but your mind itself is not in any bubble. The mind is open. The apparent formation of your ego self is a movement within the openness of your mind. So if we want to find the openness or find ourselves in the openness, stay present with whatever is occurring, with it, neither merge nor apart from it, and then whatever is occurring will vanish. The content of the mind is always changing. And then without effort, you will have the sense of openness. Okay, so again, we sit not intending anything, and we're simply present with however it is, doing less. Okay. And when you're doing the practice on your own, and you <clears throat> come to the end of your sitting time, just as you've been uh, receiving whatever was occurring in the openness of awareness. So you want the same to occur as you get up and make a tea or get out and go to work, whatever you're doing. All that you experience is the energy of the mind it arises and passes. When things seem to remain, this is also the energy of the mind. What binds us into the construct is our own grasping or desire to hold on to something. So to support us in opening in the practice, we use the Guru Yoga of the White R. The Guru is your intrinsic awareness. This intrinsic awareness can show itself as Padma Sambhava, as a person, it can show many different forms. All of these forms are the energy or the potential of the guru, but the, the guru itself is the mind which is like the sky. And the yoga means to relax into this sky-like openness. Often the word uh, yoga is uh, translated as a union or joining or linking. However, separation is an illusion. There have never been two different things. These are simply the arising of uh, misleading concepts. The misleading concepts arise in the mind. They are as empty as clouds in the sky. But when you merge into them and take them seriously, then they solidify. The practice is to relax into the openness which is always available. This is the, the transmission of uh, the actual, the, the intrinsic, according to Dzogchen. In the Zen tradition, they talk about the transmission of the lamp, as if the, the, the lamp or, let's say, the candle of the teacher's mind becomes the, a fire from which you can light your own candle. But here, it is the, the presence of Samantha Bhadra, the primordial Buddha's mind, this infinite sky, opens us to our own sky. Your mind has never been closed. The closure is in, within the open. If you build a house out in the country, the doors and the windows keep the wind out, but they don't keep the space out. The building is in space. The walls of the house keep the wind out, but they can't keep the space out because they are built in space. The non-duality of appearance and emptiness is the beauty of the mind. And emptiness is the purity of the mind. So when you look outside and see the open sky and the clouds in it, you can see the clouds as something filling the sky or blocking the sky. Then you experience two things, the open sky, which is now limited because of the presence of the cloud. That is a dualistic interpretation. 
but the cloud is in the sky. Nobody put the cloud into the sky. You only find clouds in the sky. The clouds are the quality of the sky. Reflections are the quality of the mirror. And thoughts, feelings, memories are the qualities of the mind. They are how the mind shows its energy. They are not blocking the mind. They only appear blocking or obscuring if you take up a fixed position outside the openness of the mind. I am looking at my mind. In order to open to the openness of the mind, I, I have to be open. The openness of awareness encounters the openness of the mind. They are not two things. This is called meditating sky to sky. It's just this, however it is. But when this subtle haze of this is happening to me, I see what's going on. When that occurs, then it's as if the sky collapses into a substance. You haven't gone anywhere. Nothing has really been split, but it is as if it has been split because now you feel different, separate. For example, you go swimming in the sea, beautiful, warm Mediterranean. You're one with the ocean. But for some reason, you become a little anxious. Oh, maybe I swam out too much. Maybe the uh, there's a tide or there's a current it will take me up further out you're in the sea you're swimming you're not drowning but this pattern of thoughts has somehow separated you from the water the sea is going to do something to me in this du duality dualizing separating is will increase your anxiety Oh, if you see, oh, just a momentary feeling and you keep swimming and it's very peaceful. You are safe in the water. The thoughts are safe in the sky. So in the practice, we sit as before, gaze is open and we imagine a white letter R about uh, a meet, bit more, a meter and a half in front of us in the sky maybe about the size of your fist. It could be a Tibetan letter R, if you know it, or just a capital white A. If you can't visualize easily, just imagine that it's there without trying to visualize it. This R represents uh, the unborn or emptiness or openness. Around it are rays of light, which are white, red, blue, yellow, and green. These are conventional colors, and they represent the five elements, the five poisons, the five wisdoms, the five skandhas, and so on. That is to say, they, they are the potential of empty, open awareness, a potential which can manifest the illusion of samsara or manifest the illusion of nirvana. Then letting the gaze rest with that, we make this uh, sound of ah together, a long, slow ah, we do three times. Oh, this is a sound of releasing any tension in the body, involvement with thoughts, feelings, and so on. Then with the ending of the sound of the third ah, this R in front of us just dissolves in space so that color and light and sound dissolve into space. And then we sit in that openness, Relax, relaxed, uh, unartificial, with nothing to do. Relaxed, unartificial, not, not doing anything artificial and with yeah, no activity. The ego, our busy self-referential mind wants to be the boss. So it always gets involved and tries to do things. But awareness is like a traditional king or queen. The queen sits on the throne. She's not in the kitchen making tea. She doesn't even need to say, bring me tea. 
the energy of the mind arises and provides whatever is here. Most of us are not born in royal families. If we want a cup of tea, we have to make it ourselves. This is why it's very easy for us to engage in the ego work. So particularly for us, we have to think, here is a hook or an invitation to do something. Does it need to be done? The hook is a potential. The power of the hook is the habit formation that this is what I respond to. Just as someone who is used to smoking cigarettes, when the thought arises, I need a cigarette, they start to light a cigarette. The body has no need of the smoke. The one that needs to smoke is the habit formation or the addiction. In the same way, the patterns in your mind, which can get you involved through a desire or aversion, these are potentiated by our involvement. You don't have to push them away or deny yourself. Just relax. And as you relax, when you see what is occurring, it thins in a subtle way from being something I need to just something. Then it's easier just to let it come and go. Okay, so we do the, the three R. Ah Okay, so <clears throat> many different kinds of experiences can arise. The key point is not to pay attention to them. We have many, many, many years of uh, practicing judgment and evaluation, seeing some experiences as good and others as bad. But here we want to see that whatever arises is simply the display or the empty luminosity of the mind. So on, a, on an outer level, you can do a little experiment. If you have a biggish mirror in your house, you can bring a selection of items from around your house, some things you like, some things you don't like so much, and you just hold them up in front of the mirror one by one. You have the feeling tone, I like, I don't like. What is it that you like or don't like? This vase, I never like this vase. But you're not looking at the vase, you're looking at the reflection. The reflection has no substance. It is empty shape and color. Then you put something that you like in front of the mirror. And you can put something you, that you like. Oh, I like this so much. This is good. But it's a reflection. No, but I like it. Look at this again and again and again. Your direct perception is seeing illusion, a reflection. Your, concept, your, con, your conceptualization is identifying things I truly like or truly don't like. In their actuality, as they are, all the reflections have the same status. But when you rely on your own habitual conceptualization, 
then you have a hierarchy of value. The value I see in the world is the value I attribute. If you really examine this again and again, wherever you are, waiting for the bus, sitting in a cafe at work, then you will, you will start to be able to distinguish between perception and conception. When the perception and the conception are fused together, this uh, linking creates a confusing density. So you don't have to change anything, but simply allow the conception to arise as a concept, the perception to arise as a perception, arising and passing. And this is very important because the openness of the mind itself is not touched by perception. When the mind is resting in its openness, it's just seeing, hearing, just this and gone. But when I'm seeing something, when I'm touch remembering something, I'm pulled into the seeming differentiation of value. Value is situational. When I'm talking just now, I'm not wearing my reading glasses. They're on the table beside me and functionally they have no value at the moment. But if I want to read something at the bottom of the screen, then I have to put the glasses on. When we see, oh, value is connectivity. It is situational. It's very important and then not at all important. Filling and emptying. Hmm. There is no permanent value in the object because there is no permanent function with the object and no permanent essence in the object. Then we see, oh, my mind is not dependent in an essential way on any object. The openness of the mind is invulnerable. And participation arising from the movement of the energy of the mind is indeed movement. It's not fixed, you can't grasp it. Like the wind blowing in the sky. The wind blows the wind, it doesn't blow the sky. So if you stay relaxed in the sky-like awareness, whatever is coming and going will cause no harm. Oh, the ego is always vulnerable. Awareness is never vulnerable. So tomorrow morning we have two sessions. If you're interested, we look a little bit more at the view of uh, Sokshen. So thank you to our translators today and um, Pedro for uh, organizing in the background all the computer things and maybe see you tomorrow. Oh, bye for now. Wonderful. Okay, so we can continue with the general theme of vulnerability. Uh, yesterday, uh, there have been many protests in Brazil about the way the government has not been attending to the uh, COVID virus. But when we look around the world, whether you have an explicit dictatorship or a pseudo democracy, many problems still arise. From the Dharma point of view, uh, we are in samsara. This is our main address. And with governments come and go, politicians uh, more or less honest. And when we are troubled by uh, what is occurring, it's very tempting to have all our energy flow out into the world to think, what can we do to make it better? But from our Dharma point of view, all the troubles that occur anywhere have the basic cause of ignoring the actual situation, how the mind is and how the mind shows itself. No matter how good external situations, the 
ego is still vulnerable. Rich people also become depressed, develop all kinds of mental illnesses. In order to stay fresh, we need to be uh, at home in the source out of which the energy of manifestation arises. So when we uh, read about the qualities of the Buddha, it's often described as being three principal factors. The first is the unimpeded um, awareness or intelligence that sees the, the truth of everything. Then the next is uh, kindness or compassion, which is the interconnectivity which keeps the warmth and openness of the Buddha close to the hearts of all beings. And the third is uh, power or ability. In, uh, in Tibetan it's Nu, uh, and the, the, the first incarnation of uh, Siya Lama was called Nu Dendorti, having this power. This power is the power to participate in the world and in an effective way, which means not to be addicted to maps or conceptual ideas about how things are, but rather to attend to the uh, particular details of the situation. And in that moment of being present with how events are occurring, because you are fully present in this uh, undivided uh, now, the, the, the time which never splits, because often we are ahead of a situation. We follow the line of what has been occurring and then predict from that what is likely to arise. Or by thinking about what is going on, we, we become a bit confused. We're not quite sure what to do. And so we're back in time. We're behind the moment as it emerges. So this links with what we looked at yesterday about being completely grounded and present with the situation as it unfolds. The world is not what we think it is. The samsaric delusion of the world is precisely what we think it is. So that's why we, we need to have the clarity of our mind, the compassion and warmth of the mind, and the non-distraction so that we can our energy manifest in relation to the actual situation. So as we looked yesterday, <clears throat> the ego is vulnerable. It is structurally vulnerable because it is not autonomous, but arises in relation to many factors. And it's uh, doubly vulnerable because it does not recognize that it is arising from these many factors. And so acting according to our idea about who we think we are or how the world is, we come into conflict with actual situations. So in Dzogchen, we are uh, always uh, focusing on our, the mind itself. In our ordinary life, we have a kind of a fusion or symbiosis between I and me. I can tell you about me. So the I is the more subject side and the me is the more object side. And when we take these as a kind of uh, twin system or a joint system, we end up with a very solidified notion of our identity. So the me, all the facts about who I take myself to be, is like a, a thickening and a densification of the potential of I. So yesterday we looked at um, this, this is, this is a tree. So you get a gradual filling out of what this is. The first, this is an unmediated openness. Oh, this, when we have this is, the implicit in this is that this is a something. So the revelation of this 
is now being taken to be problematic. What is this? And this leads us into the formulation, this is a tree. So the openness of just this requires nothing to be done. And see how people, when they're in nature or maybe sitting on a beach at sunset, watching the sun going down in the ocean, is just this. It's like a, an internal shower that's washing out the accumulation of busy activity. There's nothing much to say because whatever you say is going to be almost an insult. It's beautiful, amazing. It was, it's beyond captured by words. Of course, if I'm open to this, and I have nothing to say, then the use of language to confirm my individual identity starts to thin out. So, um, if I'm just in this open silence, then I'm not employing words to confirm my individual identity. Once I start to talk and communicate, about my experience, then I have an objectification of this fresh vital moment. And we have the same thing with I. I, I am, I am a person. I is just, it's without shape. It's simply a presence. I is indicating here I am, but this I is this. When we move to I am, then I am a particular kind of existence. I have existence or I am an existent. And if I say I am a person, this is not uh, the end of the story. Because people will say, yeah, but what kind of person are you? And then a whole narrative account unfolds. So when we formulate ourselves as an entity, we have a closing of the pot the closing of our access to the potential of the source. So in Sokshen, we uh, talk about these three linked aspects. They are not three things joined together, but they're like three facets of a crystal. The first is um, how, the, how the mind is, the, the openness. This openness is inseparable from awareness. It's not a thing, it's never uh, limited. So it's often said, it's like the sky. When you look at the sky, you can't see where it begins or ends. Depending on your positioning, sometimes the sky can look small. If there's a lot of clouds, sometimes it looks very big. That's how it appears to us according to positioning. But the sky itself is not conditioned by our positioning. So this, when we look for our mind, when we sit and we, we think, is our, my mind big or small? Does it have an inside and an, or, and an outside? Can it be captured by any of the concepts that I use to identify the, the things that I see existing in the world? Then we see whatever I, conclusion I come to, whatever proposition I have, just dissolves by itself. The openness of the mind is indestructible. It's called the Vajra, which means stands for emptiness. <clears throat> it's uh, said to be primordially pure. Now, we know in this world that everything gets dirty. There's always dust or grime, the wind blows, all kinds of things. That is to say, something comes in, a, in the window and starts to form a, a little patina on top of the table. This is touched and affected by that. So the condition necessary for uh, dirt or defilement 
or impurity is duality. The sky doesn't make the sky dirty because the sky includes everything. And we see the sky as space. Everything is inside the space. Or with the other familiar example, the reflection doesn't defile the mirror. Well, this open, indestructible, undefilable presence is our own actual basis moment by moment. It's not that this is where we come from because it's not somewhere else. We are manifesting in the space of awareness, just as the reflection is in the mirror. So the, this ungraspable openness of the mind shows itself as the ceaseless flow of revelation, which is its, uh, called its clarity. Uh, which is, and this is what we call, this revelation is what we call its clarity. Everything we see, everything which arises in our minds, sensation in our body is there for us. It arises as something we experience. When we relax and the mind is open, many things continue to arise. We practice with our senses open. We're not saying the mind is inside and the world is outside. This separation is a delusion. When you're sitting, you can experience sensation in your body and the sound of a car outside your flat. Both are experienced. Where does the experience come from? If you stay present, it is clear that it's a experience the revelation of the clarity or the potential or the illumination of your own mind. Then as you get up from the meditation and you move around, you are a movement within this field of clarity. You are an apparition. That is to say, you appear, but you're not the appearance of something. So, in summertime, if you're driving in a car, you see a mirage on the road. Looks like the appearance of water, but actually it's not the appearance of anything. It's a, an illusion, which is to say, it's an appearance devoid of substantial content. So, if you take the fresh directness of your sitting practice into the world, into yourself in the world, you see, oh, I am experience. So if a thought arises, I feel tired or I feel happy, this is like a, an empty cloud. If you had on a dark night a big searchlight and you moved it across the sky, yeah, a big searchlight, like the ones that the military use for identifying planes, a very big lamp in the sky, yeah? And you move it across the sky, a cloud appears and vanishes. In the same way, the cloud-like movement of thoughts appear and then vanish. We know that they're here because the they are our experience, but they're gone before we can apprehend them. The fact that they appear doesn't mean you can't grasp them. No, you can't grasp a rainbow. You can't grasp a thought. The thought arises, it vanishes, it vanishes but because of the direction of attention and interest, the second thought arises in relation to the first, which has gone. I'm thinking about a thought, and the thought that is thinking about the thought has the same emptiness as the first thought. So when you see directly, every experience is just going and going and going. Then truly, this life is a dream. All that you have been, so many moods, situations, occupations, and so on, all that is gone. 
you can tell people about what you did when you were a child. This is no one talking about nothing. We're back in Disneyland. When I was young, I had a bicycle. We like stories. And then you say, oh, where did you go on the bicycle? Was it a good bicycle? Was it very heavy? These old fashioned bicycles, they weighed so much. Thought, empty thought is following empty thought is following empty thought. So this is uh, like the, the dance that Salome used to do, the dance of the seven veils. She is naked, but these fine silk veils are around her. And so you can't quite catch her body. Each veil by itself would be quite transparent because it is so fine. But when one is in front of the other, seven deep, then you can't become so opaque. So we know this about our lives. The more you think about something, the more real, the more solid, the more important it becomes. This thinking about is massaging the energy of the mind, which we take as imagination, creativity is being massaged into this empty mirage-like appearance. So if we stay with the openness of the mind, the revelation is complete. It's not divided into subject and object. That is to say, subject and object are patterns of this ungraspable illumination of clarity. You don't have to try to go into some artificial state of all is one. Non-dual means neither one nor many. They arise together. Subject and object are born together. They are a patterning of the field of revelation. So this is uh, how our mind is, or how the Buddha's mind is, not, not different. So why is it that we, it is not immediately obvious to us? Because although whatever arises is already vanishing, the referentiality of a specific thought seems to make it more than it is. So if I say um, banana, nothing much. In the wartime in Britain, there were no bananas. So then the banana was something amazing. So under those conditions, people's longings and memories and hopes seem to arrive inside the shape of this banana. Just as if you go in the Catholic church, you see a crucifix. This means something to the people who are Christian. But in the early days of Christians, <clears throat> when the non-Christian uh, tribes came in from Asia, they would see this golden cross as gold. So they didn't project the death of Jesus, the hope of resurrection into this piece of metal. They saw gold. But for the Christian, this, the cross is such an incredible symbol. They don't believe I'm looking at the two pieces of wood. They believe I'm looking at the cross. And when the, <clears throat> when the priest is giving them this uh, wafer and putting it on their tongue in the, in the mass, in the, this is the flesh of Jesus Christ. This is the body of Christ. Really? So. In the Christian tradition, you have some people who say this symbolizes the body of Christ. And for other people, due to the ritual of the Eucharist, this is the actual body of Christ. It's not a symbol, it's an actual presence. So you can see this by looking at the culture around you. People who believe in their local football team think it's the best in the world. So if you, if you can observe this and see, oh, the energy of the mind can be 
seem to arise inside the object so that the object has the power and therefore I get caught by the object. So I believe the energy of my mind with faith goes into the object, projected into the object. Now, if you were projecting light onto a screen and you switched off the projector, the screen would go dark. But for the Christian, every time they go into the church, the crucifix is very holy, so they, they cross themselves. They don't have to keep imagining, oh, for me as a Christian, this piece of wood is the holy cross. So the meaning stays embedded in the object, but it's only in the mind. When I was up in, uh, in Zangskar, up in the north of India, in the first monastery, uh, as you move from the, the mainly uh, Muslim area of the main road, there's a statue of the Buddha with a bullet hole in it. Because the, when the Muslims were invading, they were attacking the statues. When the Muslims invaded that part, they were shooting at the statues because they didn't like them. They didn't just think, oh, this is a piece of metal. This is a sign of the infidel who is worshiping false gods. So they believe this is the sign of a bad religion. Whereas for the Buddhists, this is a sign of a good religion. Actually, it's neither. The meaning of a statue is not inherent in the statue. The meaning is in the mind. So if you have the sense of this, in the text, it describes the various stages in which ignorance thickens in the world. The first is called the Dagni uh, Chipu. It means something like the soul something. The soul, S-O-L-E, yeah, the soul, the only something, the one true something. So if, before we were looking at this, this is. So this first level of ignorance is this is. So instead of there being simply a, an open, empty appearance, there is a kind of um, vibration or facticity in this. Something insists, it's, it's there. Like if, um, if, a, if a car backfires, if you get a bang from a car, oh, something. It vanishes, but there's a kind of echo or trembling which brings the interpretive turn of what is that? And so the, the movement of the potential of the mind starts to form around this point, like a crystal forming in a solution. As this somethingness seems to continue in time, because actually it is an experience, a way of experiencing. It's not actually a thing. It is the experience of the delusion of a thing. There is an experiencer. So now you have this separation of subject and object, experience and experience. And these two polarities are linked together. They are born together. There is no subject without object. There is no object without subject. And as they move together, it gives rise to particular formations. So when you look around the world and you see butterflies, they are moving in the sky, but not in the way that a bird moves. Their experience is very light and delicate. So I, I can't even imagine what it's like to be a butterfly, but somehow their subjectivity draws them to their, their particular object formations. So their subjectivity reveals a particular contouring of this uh, potential of the field of revelation. We live in a different world. 
you could say objectively we live in the same world, but our subjectivity shines through our sense organs. And due to the structures of our body, we are interested in food, safety, sex, and so on. So as subject and object interact more and more, and the patterns of and the patterns of habit formation become invested in the stream of our individual becoming, in the stream of our individual becoming. This uh, stream is called the uh, Santana or in Tibetan Ramvyut, Ramvyut, which which means like a self thread. So, if you imagine you had a a big box of many different kinds of beads, some of wood, some of plastic, and so on. And there's maybe a, a girl of eight years of age. So here is your thread. Now you can make whatever necklace you want. So you can imagine the girl taking out all the beads and looking at the colors and the shapes, what would be nice to wear. So. This is the thread of our life, the thread of our presence in the world, engages with the potential of the beads of different situations. Some we like, some we don't like. So as we go through life, we put many different beads along our string. And these choices, although they occurred in the past, create tendencies into the future. And this is how we come to be born in the different realms of samsara. We look at other people's lives and we think, oh, okay, but I wouldn't live that way. So we go back to the ego. The ego is not autonomous. It's not self-existing. It's not a fixed thing. It's a potential of participation as shape. So, as, a, as an ego person, we are always forming our life. Sometimes we feel more active shaping of what's going on. We actively examine and select and decide. And sometimes life's just happening to us. We're just kind of swept along by patterns. So going back to this first moment of ignorance or ignoring, the openness is there. This intense moment is within the space of the sky, like a sudden boom of thunder. It's in the sky, but it seems not to be in the sky. It's this. And this with energy in it becomes this is. And then because this is something and you're caught up in identifying what kind of something it is, the undivided field of experience is lost sight of. It's still there. It's not lost somewhere else. It is ignored. For example, I just remembered that as a child, we would go on holiday to the, to the sea in Scotland. And you would run down the uh, sand dunes onto the beach. And immediately I would go over to the rocks to see if there were any little crabs in the pools. So my parents would go and sit on the sand. They were not very interested in the rock pools. But I was not interested to sit on the sand. I wanted to be on the rocks. The whole beach was open. But all it wasn't evenly open because for me, I had a bias or a prejudice. So without deciding to ignore the other possibilities, they were effortlessly functionally ignored because I was fixated on the rock pools. So although this uh, openness of the mind is always available and no one is hiding it from us. It is our own obsession and our own particular uh, 
patterning of value which hides the openness from us. So in that way, I became the kind of boy who could spend all day on the rocks. It was as if this was some wonderful world which was ceaselessly unfolding for me. Now, if I was to go back there, I would maybe look at the rocks for five minutes. So that's what is meant by karma. The possibility of the rocks holding this attention for me, this arose due to causes and conditions in my mind stream, which was there for a while. And then it thins out, it dissolves. At that time, it was thick or dense or powerful. So if we think of these three qualities of the Buddha, the third one is the power, power to make things happen. This power for the Buddha is arising inside the open field where everything is very clear. But for me, as a boy, the power of the mind was focused on something quite narrow. It was caught by the potential of the rocks. And in particular, it was caught by the importance of finding a bigger crab than my brother. So, yeah, how, that's how we see the ego forming. If winning, then very happy. If losing, then very sad. So the, the attention makes some things important. The importance gives rise to intense emotions. These intense emotions are another kind of shrinking or veiling. This is the dynamic unfolding of our life in samsara. Okay, so if we have a break now until quarter past. So that's 25 minutes break till quarter past. Okay, have a good break. So we could start with the uh, practice as we did yesterday, doing the Guru Yoga of the White R, and very gently keep the flavor of what we've been looking at. The, the mind is like the sky. It's not harmed by clouds. It's not uh, benefited by rainbows. So whatever is occurring, just allow it to be there and to go. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is a very simple practice to do. You might wonder how could such a simple thing be effective? It's simple because the structure of our experience is simple. What is complicated are our thoughts about our situation. So, as many of you will know, if we, we can look at the Dharma in terms of the paths of the cause and the paths of the result. If you start by thinking that I am essentially a, a bad person or a limited person, then clearly I will have to work very hard to become a good person or even a Buddha. There are many things to be removed and purified, and we have to make the accumulations of merit and wisdom. And when the journey takes a long time, many, many lives, 
in each life, we're still vulnerable to the impact of very difficult situations. But uh, the higher Tantra and uh, Dzogchen belong in the paths of the result. That is to say, we see that ignorance is not a thing, it's a delusion. Our life is like a dream and sometimes a nightmare. And inside the dream, it is as if things are real. When you wake up, you see a dream was a dream. Even our general reflection on impermanence can help with that. Each of us can see that I was a child. You know, you know this about yourself. You were a child and now you are not. That is to say you inhabited the dream of childhood and now you are in the dream of adulthood. And that sometimes you've had the dream of being healthy and sometimes the dream of being sick. In a dream, there seems to be a, a, a clear truth to what is occurring. And then suddenly something else is occurring. And perhaps when we look at our lives, at how it actually was, we see the same thing. Situations, relationships can seem completely important, and then suddenly we tumbled out of them. This gives us a sense that the obscuration that lies between me and how it is, is not something fixed. I'm not locked out by a big metal door. My openness is hidden by the fixation of my attention. It's not the objects or appearances of my experience, which are the determining factors, but how I relate to them. It is belief, attachment, involvement, identification. These are all activities. If we don't, release the energy of our potential into these activities, they will not occur. Not so complicated. We keep the show, the display of samsara going. You might experience a lot of anxiety or depression or confusion and then try to control them. That's not very helpful. These are patterns of energy return to the central point. Who is the experiencer? What is the ground of the experiencer? And when you see the ground of the experiencer, you also see the ground of the experience because they are not two separate things. Oh, when we make the sound of ah three times, we are releasing what we have been holding on to, the activities of the day. We are attached perhaps to anxiety. We might worry, we might uh, not believe in ourselves, uh, attack ourselves. These are activities which generate the experience of being worthless and stupid and so on. You are filling out the empty space of identity. I, I am, I am someone. What kind of person am I? a stupid, useless person. This is, a this is a constructive process. You are not completely stupid from the very beginning. The most stupid thing about you is that you believe you are stupid. It's a belief. If you believe in something false, you will get that consequence. People be have believed in fascism, communism, in the need to burn which is alive. These are beliefs. I am a human being. I, I am a human being. That's a belief. You've been encouraged in the culture to believe that this is your true identity. This is the, the limit of your existence. If you're a human being, you're not a dog or a frog. But we believe that the, the Buddha manifested in the form of a human being in order to show people that the form of a human being 
doesn't mean that there is an essence of a human being that you are always limited. The fact that the fact that you manifest in a human form doesn't mean that the shape of this form is the ultimate uh, determinant of who you truly are. The open ground allows manifesting as Buddha or human being. Human beings and dogs and frogs are all sentient beings who don't see the open ground. You are fortunate because you have a human body and you have in this life some connection with the Buddha Dharma. When you believe that you are human and that you need to save your money for your pension and uh, become a proper functioning member of society, and if you do this, then you, and if you do this, then you will be a, a good human being. And then there is no space for anything else. But as we know, Dharma says, "Oh, look." Your life is always changing and fading away. You are building sand castles on the edge of the ocean. Everything you make is washed away. So maybe there's another possibility. The focus of your energy so far has been to manipulate and manage the patterns of experience which occur. <laughs> And there is no end to this process of involvement. There is always something to be done. Summer is coming for the people in Europe. And uh, so you can think about going on holiday, you change your clothing because the weather gets warmer and so on. There are plans to be made. And then you die. So who is the one who is making the plans? If we only abide if we only dwell inside the shape of I am myself, then this will keep us connecting with new elements of narrative production. So we want to relax back just to I. I is naked. It's not covered with anything. No attribution of qualities. And therefore, on what basis would you say good or bad? I is presence. The presence of the openness of the ground. This presence allows us to manifest in the world. I, I am, I am James. James is an extension of I. It's the energy of I moving out in particular patterns. The word James, or the name James, points to an ever-shifting patterning. You can talk about the image of James and describe it in terms of certain characteristics. If we watch a movie or uh, read a novel, we are used to taking signifiers to indicate the uh, personality, intention, and so on. The story seems to, if it's a good, well-told story, it seems to catch the person. They are a believable character. But when we look directly at ourselves, can you believe in yourself? moment by moment, when you walk down the street, new experiences are arising. You are touched and moved by many things you do not know will occur. How I am is revealed through emergence. I do not know how I will be in the future. How I will be is not made by me. I is not pointing to any enduring essence. I is how I experience being present with this unpredictable manifestation. I am present with all this as this in this moment. Next moment, I will not be as this. This is a showing. 
the showing of our potential for co-emergence. Because it's co-emergent, it's not my possession. So if I'm stuck in my ego fixation and I want to be happy and I don't want to be unhappy, then why are you making me unhappy? Why are you so horrible? This is an ordinary way of experiencing life. When you speak to me in this way, you make me really upset. So I'm complaining that you impact me. Because I'm just me. You should just let me be me. This is how we see suffering is in samsara. Because what is this me that I am? It depends. If it depends, then it's dependent. Then it's not independent. It's not autonomous. So if I am dependent, how can I be self-defining? This is the mental dullness. The dullness of not seeing that we are full of shit. Hypocritical. Preferring to pretend rather than to see. I don't exist as a thing. This can seem very terrifying. Well, then who am I? And that way of phrasing the question pulls it back to, but I'm here. I, I have to have something to hold on to. I don't want to go crazy. I have to, I have to know who I am. Well, this is the agitation of the ego in the face of its false belief in its own true existence. This is why when we do the practice, we don't struggle with the ego. We don't go to couple therapy with our ego in one chair and our awareness in another. And the therapist says, I can see for you to it's hard even to be in the same room together. The last thing we want is to have some pseudo conflict between our ego identity and our Buddha potential. There is actually no conflict, but there appears to be a conflict because the ego insists on a very limited notion of identity. The ego is a lie living living through lies and making more lies. In Italy, you had Berlusconi as your wonderful leader. How is this possible? The Americans had Trump. How is this possible? Clearly, for many people, their ego is a, a place of great confusion. They believe, oh, we need a leader who is a liar and a cheat. It's such a difficult thing to lead a good life. Maybe it's better just to have some crazy self-indulgent narcissist in charge. Many, many, many people vote for terrible leaders. This is the sign of mental opacity. So we have to accept we also get infected with deluded ideas. But from the point of view of Sokshen, don't struggle to free yourself from this. The reality of the delusion is based on not seeing that delusion is delusion. So at the beginning of the practice, we see this white eye in front of us, the image of open emptiness. This is the source, the ground, with the five uh, rays of light, the potential, of the five poisons and the five wisdoms. The five poisons arise through not seeing the nature of the ground. That is to say, they arise from believing in their own existence. Whereas the five wisdoms arise from being aware that their ground is the open, empty base. And as we make the sound of ah, we relax and release, relaxing and releasing identification with sensation, memory, thought, feeling, and so on. And then we're just sitting. Of course, experience continues, but we have released ourselves from the fixation on the idea of I mean myself as a separate entity. A thought arises, 
like the mirage. It is occurring, but it is the occurrence of open emptiness, which then vanishes. So, for example, you might have a moment of anger. You remember something someone said to you, and then it goes. But somehow there is a stickiness. You're not finished with that. And so another thought arises about this person and why they should speak to you in that way and so on. You are having thoughts. The first arising of anger or irritation had no owner until you owned it. As you believe in the thought, as you feel it's got something important to say, then the truth of the thought and the restrictedness of your experience merge together. Oh, we all know what this is like. You get in a bad mood and, and you sink into yourself. So in the practice, when this um, collapse or condensation occurs, we stay relaxed and open. If the energy of awareness is invested in the limited thought, then it is as if the thought becomes real of awareness. It's as if it becomes something real. In the traditional example, rigpa or awareness is said to be like the sun arising in the empty open sky. The rays of the sun come in the kachas and you feel warm. But if you have a magnifying glass, and you hold this out in the bright summer sun, then the focused uh, light point will start to cause a fire. So in the same way, the creative potential of the mind, when it is intensified in a narrow focus, it starts to have this uh, aggressive impact. This is why we meditate with our eyes open, our senses open. There is space for everything. Once you focus on a particular thing which is arising, which could seemingly be outside or inside, then this intensification creates um, a disjunction. It's uh, overprivileged. Just as for me as a child on the beach, the rock pool is what is important. The more I fixate on the rocks, the less I see of the beach. But the rocks are on the beach, they are part of the beach. In this way, the actually undivided appears to be divided by the intensity of my focus. So the same occurs in the meditation. The mind is relaxed and open. A particular form arises momentarily. It becomes interesting or important it becomes the figure, the, the focus, and the rest recedes. This is the meaning of duality. Nothing has actually been separated. The thing that you are fixated on is within the spacious mind. But that's invisible because of the fixation. So this is the delusion that this thing is a thing. I am thinking the thing. I create this. It is important because I make it important. It is not intrinsically important, nor is it intrinsically unimportant. It is what it is, and what it is is the radiance of the mind. When we see this, then we are invulnerable. When you see that the reflection in the mirror is just a reflection, you, can, you don't have to take it seriously because it's just a reflection. But we are habituated to saying good, bad, right, wrong, mine, yours. The energy of judgment is the force of the ego. No, no, of judgment, of judgment. We allocate the value that we see. Everything which arises is empty. So 
you look in a big mirror, you see something, a reflection which is beautiful, you see a reflection which is ugly. They are reflections. But you say, this is beautiful, this is ugly. The actuality is the evenness, the equality of appearance and emptiness. But when we grasp at it, as if the reflection was the reflection of something, then it seems a good idea to be able to discriminate uh, and attribute value. All appearance is the appearance of emptiness. So we're back to the, the, the key point. This and the concept of this are not the same. The ego manipulates the concept of this. The ego can't do anything with this. So the ego is always trying to bump or tilt the game towards somethingness so that it thinks about and feels about what is occurring with a clear, rarefied sense of the true separate existence of these uh, appearances. If you can believe in Donald Duck, then you can believe in samsara. Donald Duck does not exist, but he appears. And because he appears, he exists in his appearance. And because we keep seeing the appearance, look, it's a picture of Donald Duck. He's there somewhere. This is just a picture, yeah, but he is there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a picture. And in this way, the image becomes the deluded basis for the imputation of real existence. So this is why in the meditation, again and again, we relax and open. We do the practice for short periods of time, because in this practice, there is nothing to be gained by struggle. We're not trying to make something happen. We have no um, predetermined intention. We simply relax and open and then remain open and present with whatever is occurring. And this unborn openness of the mind is truly invulnerable and indestructible. No pattern is the truth of me. If a pattern could be the truth of me, then why don't I look the same as I was when I was eight years of age? How I was at that age was the emergence of the potential into the field of the many factors that were operating. It was manifestation of the unborn potential, misinterpreted as the truth about me. So whenever we do the practice, we are again and again releasing ourselves from the tendency to construct a seeming self-existing phenomena. It is the concept and the belief in the concept which creates the delusion. So when you observe thoughts, feelings, memories arising, they come and they go, they have no inherent power to do anything. It is our, the energy of the mind in its diluted form of attachment, which empowers the concept. The, the concept has no power of its own. So when we see this, now thoughts arise as our allies, because we recognize that they are the radiance of the mind shining, dancing, creating patterns, but not establishing any real existence. And so life is open. If we stay with the freshness, it's always fresh. But if we bury ourselves inside the mountain of concepts, then life becomes dull and dense. So now we come to, towards the end of our time together. Dharma is very deep. There are many books to read, many things to learn. 
quite possibly you will die before you have read all the Dharma books you have. Hmm. Maybe you can be burned on the top of the pile of your books. They can be pulped down, make papier mache to make a coffin of Dharma books for you. The main thing is to study your own mind, to feel the fresh, innocent, virgin eye. And this eye moves everywhere without you. Eye is the site of freedom. And if you rest in this freedom, then all the possible forms of I can arise without any limitation. So again and again, when we do our practice, we should offer the whatever merit comes from it for the benefit of all beings, particularly those who, who are uh, imperiled by the virus. Because of the virus, I still don't know if I will be able to travel in the autumn to, to do retreats in different places. But if not, then some Zoom events will continue. So thank you to our translators, Giovanna, Juan, Milton, and to Pedro and Yao for the organization. And recordings of this will be made available on the website soon. And we have a, a few more evening meetings in the month of June. So I say goodbye now. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Bye.